Okay, we're going to be talking about Nahum, and in the Gideon Bible there, it's page 965. And Nahum was a prophet. Now, we don't know very much about him other than what he says in the first couple of verses. But before I get to Nahum, I'm going to give you a little background story. Now, Nahum went to preach to Nineveh, but he didn't go to Nineveh. You know, remember earlier Jonah went to Nineveh, we'll talk about that later. But Nahum was preaching against Nineveh, but he's talking to the southern kingdom of Israel to try to encourage them and letting them know that Nineveh is not going to come down and destroy them like they did the northern kingdom. So that's what this is about. And what I want to let you know is that God is a loving God. Now sometimes people will say, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I like the God of the New Testament. God of the Old Testament is full of vengeance and bitterness. God of the New Testament is all about love. But they don't fully understand the Bible. They don't understand that it's all one long story, okay? And they both tie together just like a hand in a glove. Now, God from the very beginning wanted people to live in peace, wanted to live in love, wanted to live in a close relationship with Him. But when sin entered the world, it destroyed everything. And because there was no really strict laws that God had given other than don't eat of this certain tree, and they violated that, then things went downhill. He had to put them out of the garden and all of this. But he wanted people to have fellowship with him, so he allowed them to procreate. And they went on and on and on until finally he said that the thoughts of men were continually wicked all the time. Now what we have to realize is that He is a loving God, He is a righteous God, and He is just. So whenever something violates His character, He has to attend to it and discipline whatever it is. Now, with Adam and Eve, when they sinned, He put them out of the garden. When people populated the earth and they kept corrupting themselves, then he had a flood come through and caused disaster, but he said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so Noah and his family went on to repopulate the earth. But while they were still on the ark, that Ham did a terrible thing to his father, having different kinds of relationships with him because his father had gotten drunk. And so Ham was cursed. So a lot of these different nations that we study about, like Russia and Iraq, Iran, Turkey, these are all descendants of Abraham, I'm not Abraham, of Noah's descendants, okay? Now, God has a plan for salvation, and it takes him a long time because there are more people who aren't born yet who are going to have the opportunity that we have of knowing Christ as our Savior. Okay, now, there are certain nations that God is dealing strongly with in the Bible. And four basic ones are there is uh, Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and then the Medes and the Persians. Okay, now, when God made a promise to Abraham that he was going to make of Abraham a great nation, he's going to bless them that bless him, and he's going to curse them that curse him. And so he made this promise he could make him a great nation, a great name, and all the world's going to be blessed by him. So God had this plan. But he said to Abraham, that I'm going to make this nation, but they're going to be in a land that they don't know about, 
for 400 years. That means that Jacob and all of his descendants, 70 of them, went down into Egypt. Now you know the story about the brother who sold Joseph into slavery and he went down to Egypt. But he became a very prominent man in Egypt because he loved the Lord God. Now, so he was a witness to Egypt, okay, about the love of God and how God would prosper people and God prospered. And the kings knew about this. But it said eventually there rose a king that knew not Joseph. And then they started persecuting the Jewish people because they said, these people are populating so much for long, they're going to have more people of their race than our race. So let's start killing all the babies. And so then when Moses was trying to protect one of the Jewish fellows, that he killed an Egyptian, and then they found out that he'd killed, and Moses ran away. And he went to the desert and so finally, after 40 years, God called him when he saw the burning bush, and he said, Moses, I want you to lead the people out. Well, now, this is what I want you to see, is God gave Pharaoh many opportunities to let his people go. And he said, let my people go so we can go out and we can worship the God that we worship. And now, see, Egypt had so many different kinds of gods. The frog god, the lice god, the fly god, any kind of a god. And so, God is trying to tell them that he is the all, all-nipotent, all-powerful god. See, so, Pharaoh says, who is your god that I should let you go? And so, he caused the plague to come on him. And then he said, oh, okay. He said, well, you can go a little way. Then he changes his mind. And God says, let my people go or I'm going to do it. And Moses did all those miracles, you know. Finally, after all the miracles, God said, let my people go because Israel is my son. He said, my firstborn son. And he said, if you don't let him go, I'm going to kill all of your firstborn sons. And so he says, uh, uh, you know, and then when the death angel, you know, they had to make, the Jewish people had to make that sacrifice and put the blood over the door and over the sides, okay? And God said to them, when I see the blood, the death angel will pass over you. But if there's no blood, there's no forgiveness you will die like the rest of the people. And so he went through the death angel and killed all the firstborn of the animals, all of the firstborn of the people. And so Pharaoh finally let them go. And so when they went out, then God did all of these miracles. You know, he opened up the Red Sea and let the people cross over and went over and the river standing up high on its, you know, banks like this. And then when the Pharaoh's army came through it, Wiped them all out. So they were destroyed. Because they had an opportunity. Because they knew at one time. The great true God. And all that could be done through Joseph. And then through Moses. And then we go on. And then. When Abraham. Back here. Was going to have a child. He said. But Lord. He said. I don't have a child. And he said. Well. You're going to have one in due time. But you know, Abraham was 100 years old plus whenever he had Isaac. And then he said, but all of the people from your area that's going to come from you are going to be down in bondage for 400 years. And he made this statement that you could read over it if you're not careful. It's in Genesis chapter 15. He says, but they will be there for 400 years. And then I will bring them out because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So now, he told this to Abraham 400 years plus before it happened. Because the Amorites were very wicked people. They were the ones that were living over where God was going to send his people. And there was all kind of wickedness, all kind of venereal disease, all kind of cult worship. And so eventually... God's people, when they came out, you know, Esau's relatives and 
Lot's relatives wouldn't let them go by until they had a fight against them, which they didn't want to do. But anyway, finally they went over to the battle. Now, you see, Egypt was destroyed. Now, when they got into the kingdom and they conquered all that land, and they became one nation under David, under Saul, he was a loser. But after Saul, it was David, and they became one nation. But after a period of time, the kingdom split. Now, I'm going to give you some dates. You don't have to write these down and memorize them, but I just want you to see the sequence of events, how God is working with Egypt and then into the promised land of those nations, then on up to Assyria, then on over to Babylon, and then on over to Persia. Now, these are the main obstacles for God. Now, in 932 B.C., okay, the kingdom split. Ten tribes of, Jew, of the Israelis went to the north, which was called Israel. Two tribes stayed to the south, which was Judah. And God said it was through Judah that the Messiah was going to come. So, now... You see, it was 930 B.C. when the kingdom split. And they split because Israel, the northern kingdom, made two golden cows. And one they put way up in the north by Dan, which is up near Iran. And the other they put over near Shiloh, where the holy temple, not the holy temple, but the tabernacle was. And there was an altar there that Abraham built. And so, when they were sinning, they, Jeroboam said, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Now, the people should have known better because they saw all these miracles that God did. Southern kingdom still worship. The northern kingdom went astray. And they were what we would call apostate. They left the true God. And he says, even in the New Testament, he says, once you have been enlightened to a certain place that God is real and He loves you and cares for you and you fall away, it's extremely difficult for you to come back once you've experienced the love of God and you went away from it. Mm -hmm. And so he says, eventually there's nothing but destruction for you. Because you say, well, I've been here before and it didn't do me any good, you know, and what good is it? And so, people will be destroyed. Now, I want you to know that God is just. He gives individuals the opportunity as well as nations the opportunity. Now, when Moses was up on the mountain and he got those Ten Commandments, the two tablets, and finally after the tablets were there, God said, get down off of the mountain, there's sin in your camp. So he went down and he saw that they were making these calves, you know, they said, this brought you out, and he broke the tablets. Well, God said to him later, he said, you make two more tablets and bring them up, and then I will write again. And then Moses is getting a little antsy here because of the people's sin. But I'm going to read something to you in... Uh, here it is. I know I had a marker there. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Now, this is God speaking to Moses. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and to the fourth generation. Now, what people misunderstand is they feel that 
Man, if I come from, my father was a child molester, he was a white feeder and everything, I'm going to be the same way. That doesn't mean that they're going to be punished for what the father did. No, it just means that because he come from a wicked father or a wicked mother, that the consequences, you know, people out here are going to say, man, that guy's wicked, you know. Don't mess with his children, you know, and they'll assume. And so those children will bear the stigma. And what we don't realize is back in those days, there were the father and the mother and the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. They all lived together. That's why he says it would visit the sons and the daughters of the next generation and the next generation is because they're all coming under that influence. And later on in other uh, prophecies, he says, I will not hold the children guilty for the father's sin. And I won't hold the father guilty for the child's sin because everyone has to answer for himself. And so that's what God is saying that now here we see that the kingdom split and for a long time the northern kingdom was worshiping these cows and they were wicked. Then God says here's this kingdom up here Nineveh. It's a really a wicked kingdom. So he says I'm going to call you Jonah and I want you to go to this city and tell them that judgment is coming. I'm going to destroy them if they don't repent and turn to me. Now, so Jonah went there. He didn't want to go there because he knew they were a wicked city. Now, remember the Assyrians were the city and God had wiped them out so much that no one even knew about Nineveh until about 300 years ago. And some archaeologists decided to search and <coughs> prove the Bible wrong, but they proved the Bible right. So here for over 15, 1800 years, people thought the Bible was just full of fairy tales and fake kings until someone in France discovered it, you know. So... What it was, now you have to picture this. They had a wall that was about 60 miles around the city. It was built on the Tigris River. It ran through there and they had water ducts that went through the city to bring them fresh water. They had a wall around that city that was 20 feet high of stone. You know, you've seen like the temple over there, it's got the stones that weigh hundreds of tons, huge stones. Well, the stones were 40, I mean 60 miles long around the place and they were 20 feet high of stone and on top of that stone they also had brick and mud, you know, made and that was another 30 feet. So these walls were like 70 to 100 feet high. That's the walls. Now, spaced all around the wall were these towers that they had. And you can look it up. Call up Nineveh on your Google sometime. And so these towers were watchtowers for the soldiers. They, some of them, reached 200 feet high. Okay? Now, here you've got this fortress. The wall is 40 feet wide and almost... 100 feet high and the towers are higher than them and these people were so wicked that they would cut off the heads of people and pile them up in front of their gates you know so it would strike terror in the hearts of people they were wicked so you can see why Jonah says hey no way I want to go there but he said I know that you are a loving God and you will forgive them. You know, when he went there, he preached you know, for three days. And then, lo and behold, those wicked people, they repented. And the king said, don't anybody eat anything for three days. Put sackcloth and ashes on you. Don't let the animals out and don't let them eat any feed. Put sackcloth and ashes. He says, who knows but the God of heaven 
might truly repent and not do it. Well, he didn't cause them to be destroyed. But, they got haughty in that. Now, here, this was in 862, and just about 10 years later, at uh, 853 B.C., Israel became what's called a vassal to Assyria, this wicked place. And so it meant that Assyria is saying, I'm going to let you live, but you got to start paying us money, you know. And so it was a vassal. And finally, the northern kingdom had these next couple of kings. The last couple of kings were wicked. Well, all of the northern kings were wicked, but these more wicked. Some of them didn't last for about a month or two months because they were all killing each other. So finally, the one king says, hey, look, I'm not going to pay any more to this guy up there. I'm going to make friends with Egypt down here, <laughs> you know. But Assyria goes down and destroys Egypt, okay, for they had rebuilt their army. And so here, then... Remember we were talking about Hosea earlier. Hosea was talking to the northern kingdom. And Hosea said, you know, he had to go marry this prostitute. And she had children from the prostitution. And it was like, God was saying, you know, Israel, you were my wife. But you were unfaithful. You went after these other gods, these cows that you call them, and then you had children from all of your harlotry, and you had them go up there and worship these cows. And so he says, I'm going to have to discipline you because they were apostate. They left God, even though they knew he was the true God, working all these miracles, so they were destroyed. They went into captivity. Then, here, Assyria is really getting big and bold, and he's going down against the southern kingdom. So he sends Sanballat down there, who was one of his generals, and uh, they surround the southern province down there, and especially Jerusalem, and He's out there, the general's out there saying, we're going to come in and we're just going to starve you out and we're going to kill you. And Hezekiah was a good king and he calls for Isaiah. And Isaiah says, don't worry about it. He said, they're not going to come into there because God's going to take care of them. Okay? So the next morning, they woke up. There was 185,000 of these soldiers had died because the death angel had gone through and then the general didn't die. He went back up to Assyria. Now, keep that in mind that when you kill 185,000 people, that really wipes out a good part of your army. Now, Nineveh was so populated, they probably had over a million people there at that time. And it was such a strong fortress thought, Nobody's going to be able to get through there. Well, lo and behold, here at uh, 723, Assyria comes down and takes the northern kingdom, and they went up into exile. Okay? And then they came back down to the southern kingdom, but Isaiah said, don't worry, God's going to wipe them out. And so then, here in... Uh, it was... 580, oh, 597, that Babylon came on the scene. Now, Babylon was in competition with Assyria for the battle struggle because they were right next to each other. And Babylon made a pact with the Medes to go fight against Assyria. So they were ready and they attacked but the Syrians were so fierce that they came out and they wiped them out, the Medes and the Persians. But they thought they had such a great victory, you know, that they went out and they got a big party and they wine women and song and they all got drunk and they were up in their watchtowers, 
and didn't realize that the Nile River was rising high and the Nile River rose up so high that it washed away a lot of the foundation of the walls and the walls came down. Okay, some of the walls came down and the Medes came in one way and the Babylonians came in the other way and they wiped them out. And it says that about three to four feet of water, because you got all these walls around there, and the water's rushing in from the Tigris River, that here, all these people walking around, and they can't move very fast, and so they were destroyed. Now, we're going to see that when we get into Nahum, and I just wanted to give you that information, that here, Assyria is a typical picture of apostasy. You know, in the book of Romans, it says that when they knew God, see, they knew God, they worshipped Him not as God, but became vain in their imagination. This is in chapter 1 of Romans, I think about 23, 22 and 23, uh, chapter, chapter 1, 22 and 23. And he says, but they worship the creature more than the creator. And with fowls and creeping things and birds and things like that. Now, Paul probably had in mind Assyria at the time. Because here Assyria, let me get back over here. To me. Okay, here it says here. Nineveh was morally corrupt, and it's described in Romans 1, chapter 21, or chapter 1, verse 21 and 23. And it says here, the chief deity, or the chief god of the apostate Nineveh was what they called the bull god. Okay, now, here's the description of the bull god. That the bull god had a face of a man, the wings of a bird, made in the image like corruptible man, and the birds, and four-footed beasts. So here you have a bull, a big bull, showing strength. And, you know, that's what they thought. They were strong. Nobody's going to fuck with a bull. And then had the face of a man. And then had wings like a bird. I mean, they're swift. They're mean. And they're smart. And they're powerful. And so, they were trusting in themselves. And as you go through, they're going to see that they had a strong economy. And they had a strong military. And they thought, the more we have, the stronger we are the less anybody's going to be able to take us, you know. And so, that's their downfall. Because as you get into Nahum, we're going to find that he's stronger. But then, here, I want you to see that in 586, Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Now, see that? That the Babylonians and the Medes captured Assyria. Then they split. The Babylonians, they were powerful and they had intermarriage. A king's wife or a king's daughter married another king's son. And so then they said, okay, we'll take this portion and you take that portion and we'll rule this whole area. Well, Babylon eventually came down because there was a tremendous trade route that Assyria had, you know, all the way from Egypt, all the way up there, and that's over a thousand miles, and it was right along the waterway. So they thought, we're going to get that waterway. So they go down, and they fight, Babylon goes down, fights against Egypt again, poor Egypt down there, they never can rise up, and then they said, uh, they sent an ambassador because they heard that Hezekiah was sick. And they sent the gift to Hezekiah. 
And Hezekiah says, oh, I ought to make friends with them, you know, because they're the power up there now, the Assyria. So he made friends with them and took them and showed them all of his castle, all of his power, all the tabernacle. And then Isaiah came in and said, what did you show them? He said, I showed them everything. He said, I showed them the king's house, I showed them my wealth and all of this. And Isaiah said, I should never have done that because Hezekiah was taking pride in everything that he had. And God said, he doesn't like pride. He said, this is all going to be carried away into Babylon one day. And he told him, it won't be in your time, but it'll be in your son's time. And so here, Babylon took siege of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Now, then here, Isaiah is taken into captivity. Ezekiel's probably up there. But what I want you to know is that when Babylon took the first wave of people up to Babylon, that it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. They were all up there. But see, God was also working there because they were witnesses for the one true God. They became very prominent because of their faith in God. And Daniel, you know, <coughs> he interpreted the dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> and Nebuchadnezzar thought, man, I'm going to make him powerful. He's over all the wizards and everything. And we just see that as a story. But then when you stop to think of when Christ was born, and after he was born, all of these kings came down from the east. They were probably from Daniel up there, you know, over the period of time who had instructed a lot of those. So God had sent Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach up there to witness to the Babylonians. And Nebuchadnezzar repented for a while. But then, you know, he had this dream. And then one time he had this dream about this tree, huge tree with all the birds and everything. And Nebuchadnezzar says, isn't this the great Babylon that I have built? You know, all of a sudden he's filled up with pride. And then Daniel goes to interpret the dream and he says, oh, King, this dream is about you. <laughs> you are that tree. He says, the tree is going to be cut down. I mean, you're going to lose your kingdom. He says, but it's only for a period of time. And you're going to be like a wild beast. And they're going to chain you to a tree. You know, and you're going to eat grass like animals. And that happened for seven years. And so then after the seven years that he was restored to his senses again. And he took over the kingdom again. But he made a decree that Daniel's God is God. <coughs> but... <clears throat> still, then Nebuchadnezzar gets off of the scene. He's somewhere else, and he lets his grandson, Belteshazzar, take <clears throat> over the rule, which is the wrong thing to do because Belteshazzar was known for all of his drunken parties and everything. <clears throat> and now here Daniel's been there. He's probably about 80 years old. And all of a sudden, they're having a drunken party with all of his princes and leaders of the country and sees this handwriting on the raw wall and it says what and it says his knees started hitting together and shaking like crazy and then he wanted to know he said who can interpret that and then nobody could do it and then he said I'll give them half of my kingdom and they'll be second in charge and so his mother or grandmother said to him, there was a time when your father, meaning his grandfather, had this dream, and there was a guy, one of the Hebrew children, that could interpret that dream. And he says his name was Daniel. And so they called Daniel up, and he said, can you read that? And he says, yes. And he said, you can have half of the kingdom, a robe and a ring and all of this. And Daniel says, keep it. <laughs> he said, but... What it means is that you have been weighed in the balance, you know, and your kingdom is going to fall. Well, see, the Medes, in the meantime, didn't like the way that Belshazzar was handling the 
program of the Babylonians. So they diverted the river that was running through there, and they came in through the river duct, and inside, while they were all up there having a drunken party, and the Medes destroyed them. And so then, you see, then Darius comes in. He's the king of the Medes. And he thought Daniel, he liked Daniel for some reason. And so then he became popular there. And then the people didn't like Daniel you know, especially the soothsayers and all that, because Daniel found favor with the king. And so they had this plot against him. And the plot was that this king should build a big statue and let nobody, you know, worship any god but him for so long a period. But Daniel was faithful to serving God. And because of that, there was a law, like the law of the Medes and the Persians could not be altered. So then Daniel did what he always did and finally they had to throw him into the lion's den. <coughs> the king didn't want to because he had liked Daniel. And see he was a witness there. And so then eventually Cyrus becomes king and lets the people that were captive in Babylon go on back to rebuild the temple. Now I said all that just to let you know that God has a plan. So he worked from Egypt up to the Amorites and he worked with all the Hittites uh, and all those ites in there. There's a ten nations or ten groups of people that they had to displace. Then he went up and worked in Assyria and he gave them the opportunity to change and then through Jonah and then he went over to Babylon and they had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel to go there and then from there they went over to the Medes and the Persians and they were still there. So God has given all of these different nations opportunities to repent and turn to him. Now, and I'm going to close with this, but I want you to see that all of these countries that they were talking about. Now, do read Nahum. You might not like it. It's sort of gory. But then I'll explain it. It is the fact that all of these nations that he worked with, Egypt, and then you have Turkey, you have Syria, then you have Babylon, which is Iraq, and then you have Persia, which is Iran. These are still people that are against Israel. Okay, But what I want you to know is these places had opportunities to repent. And some of them did, but some of them didn't. And God had no choice but to wipe them out. Now, if we get down to our own area, our own regions, you look at Germany had a chance. To do all of this and repent. And they did for a while. But then they fell by the ways out. You look at Great Britain. They used to be a great military. During the wars. But little by little by little. Their churches became empty. And the people became complacent. And they lost their power. And so when they started dictating the rules to the people. Then they came over here. The pilgrims came over here to get away from that tyranny. And we see that now Britain has lost all of their power and influence almost. And then we become the famous nation. We become number one, the big guy, you know. And so we, now all of these different countries depended on their economy and on their military. And they soon fell. We have the strongest economy in the world that anyone's ever known. We have the greatest military power that has ever been known. But now we're facing situations where we don't realize God is still at work. Even in this pandemic, you know, he's causing people to either make a choice, you know, am I going to get the vaccine or am I not going to get the vaccine? Am I going to trust in God or am I going to trust in my wealth and my stealth and my stay home type 
mentality. What will I do? And so God is slowly eroding our economy. Now, with the stimulus package, you know, we got one, then we got two, now they're talking about three, and we might even get a fourth one, you know, but then we're losing our ability because the police, who wants to go to be a policeman anymore? Who wants to go into the army? And what I want to say is a lot of times we think about when you go through Nahum, you're going to say, man, they did this and they did that and they did this. Then we have soldiers coming home from battle that have what they call post-stress syndrome, PTS, okay? And so it's, it's rampant among our military. And you can understand it when you see that some of these areas are so hostile and so violent that they would take small children and strap bombs on them and tell them to go over and shake hands with that man over there. He'll give you candy. And then the soldier sees this kid coming, knows he's got a bomb strapped to him, and they're going to blow him up as soon as he gets in front of the soldiers. And you have to decide whether I'm going to shoot that kid over there or I'm going to let him come in here and blow us all up. And if you shoot him and you see that blow up, you know, the thing that would haunt you in your mind, you can't imagine <laughs> when someone's walking around like this and they're looking and all of a sudden they step on a bomb or a landmine that blows their legs off. You say, you know, so who wants to be a soldier? Because you start saying, what am I fighting for? You know, all of the big to do they had for the Viet not the, yeah, Vietnam War, that those soldiers, they came back and they were booed and they were bad, you know. Like, what are you over there for? So, we're getting to the place where we're going to defund the police, we're going to defund the military, we're going to open all of our borders, and America is going to be judged by God because we are falling, falling, falling away. Now, we are here, and he says... You are the light of the world. As long as you were here, you know, you are the light. So you have to live like everyone needs to know Christ as Savior. And that's what he says here. He says, God is good, but he's also just. And he has to punish the wrongdoer one way or the other. And Jesus said, I took his punishment. All he's got to do is come to me. And they say, I can do it on my own. You know, and it's pride that's built up. So I'm going to stop there. And I promise next week we'll go through Nahum and we'll get through there real quickly. Okay. And we have to realize when you read that, especially the third chapter of Nahum, you're going to see that God is just. Now, when you read it, read it carefully, because sometimes Nahum is talking to the Jewish people, trying to give them... By the way, his name means comfort, consolation. But when you look at that, you say, well, how could that be <laughs> consolation? Well, anyway, he came from up north, and a lot of scholars believe that his name is Nahum, and there's a town up there where Jesus went, and it's called Capernaum. And Capernaum, Capernaum means village of Nahum. So we're not sure that's where it got its name, but Nahum at that time was a common name. So anyway, but Nahum probably knew that the northern kingdom of Israel was going to go into captivity. And so he went south to the southern kingdom and he's preaching to them telling them don't worry about Assyria and he says go ahead have your sacrifices have your feast worship God but because they were in a state of backslidden too and that's why Babylon came down okay let's stop there